Welcome to Digging Deeper with Backyard Farmer. I'm your host, Kim Todd. On Digging Deeper, we have in-depth discussions with extension experts about those important landscape topics. Tonight, we're going to take a look at irrigation. Thank you for joining us once again for Digging Deeper with Backyard Farmer. It's been hot and humid here in the state with a lot of thunderstorms rolling through and that kind of weather can really take a toll on your landscape, especially if you overwater it or underwater it. So here to discuss this and those advances in turf irrigation is our turf grass specialist, Bill Kreuzer. And Bill, it's not just turf, is it? It's all the landscape and it's all needs water at some point, but let's start out by talking about why we irrigate. Yeah, so why do we irrigate? Uh, and the main reason that we irrigate is for the plants to cool themselves off, right? So it's getting hot outside and we sweat and that sweating cools us off. That's why the plants are, are, uh, are sweating, they're, they're losing water. And so as they're losing water, we have to replace that water. And I don't care if it's grass or if it's a tree. I know I've had some river birds that are pretty young that are uh, struggling with that heat. Yeah, that's, that's been problematic. And so we're watering trees, we're watering our flowers, we're watering our shrubs, we're watering our lawns. And so we really wanna make sure that we're uh, keeping those plants watered so they can cool themselves and be able to survive Nebraska heat, right? But not over water, because that can be problematic for disease and uh, lots of other reasons too. So before we started talking on air about this, Bill, we were talking about, is it really necessary to have an irrigation system, an automatic or semi-automatic or partially automatic? And if, if so, why? And if not, why not? And how do we do that right? Yeah, and there's a couple of different reasons for that. Yeah. Now, I mean, a lot of new developments mandate you have to have right. a system, right? right? So they can have your green landscape. Um, but from a science perspective, uh, it is good to, uh, you know, to have some kind of irrigation either in ground or in, on an automated or, or not just to kind of water those plants. Um, but it really depends on the plant and where you live in the state. Right. In, in Nebraska, on the eastern side of the state, we can get 40 inches of rain. And, and most of that really does come in our summer spring periods. And so the plants use a lot of that water during that wet period. And generally, especially for a lawn, that's a pretty equal replacement. But occasionally we'll have those really high uh, drought periods of maybe a week to 10 days to two weeks. And our soils can only hold so much to that 40 inches at a time. And if they can't, well then we need to get the hose to, uh, to maybe water. And maybe it depends too, if you have a bluegrass lawn, you wouldn't even need to worry about it. If you have tall fescue lawn, you got to irrigate it, it'll die. Uh, and so <laughs> that's kind of a, you know, one of the important things. And you go into the western part of the state, you're getting 15 inches of rain a year. And that's just not enough to sustain any of our grasses. And they're either going to go dormant or they're going to, uh, to die out. And that's why we don't like you know, blue or a tall fescue and some of those more water hungry grasses in the western part of the state. Well, you know, and that really applies to our landscape plants too, especially if people um, it, have purchased a plant that has a poor root system mm -hmm. or they don't realize it does. They put it in the landscape. They then expect their lawn irrigation system to water those shrubs and those trees in the amounts they need at the time they need on the days they need it. And that doesn't necessarily work. And I know there's a little bit of argument sometime right. between, you know, grass people and tree people about right. who wins, but I still contend that those trees win. They have a nice they do. Dude root they system do. and that grass, you can see the grass suffer right. when there's tree roots underneath of it. So right. we really are watering our landscape. Uh, right. And so, you know, how do we do that efficiently so we're not wasting water? Because recently we had a lot of rain in Lincoln and I was out going to visit some golf courses and I saw uh, a lot of irrigation systems running after two inches of, of, of water uh, falling from Mother Nature, right? And so, right. you know, things that we can try to do to minimize that is, is really what we're trying to accomplish uh, so we're more efficient in our watering. All right, so talk a little bit more about that because you, you brought some toys to talk yeah, about. Yeah, so I brought a couple of different technologies here. These are really designed for, these first two, for kind of your uh, in-ground automated sprinkler systems. And one of the biggest challenges with these systems is knowing if, the, if it's rained or not. And so this is a, a rain gauge. There's different vari variations of this. Uh, this one just clips right onto your, uh, your gutter at your house. Huh. And then it's just a wireless transmission down to a receiver at your uh, we uh, weather station. Some of the ones uh, you can actually twist uh, the top to say how much rain it would take to disable the system. 
So if you got a little bit of mist, I know my mom always does this, and I don't want to throw <laughs> her under the bus, but she goes, oh, it rained. Well, we got a, you know, five hundredths of an inch. It didn't really do anything but wet the ground, right? right? So you can set how much rain needs to hit this before it would turn your system off. And so that's a nice uh, way to do it. Um, but when we get two inches of rain, they should all be off, right? So uh, that's one of these systems. You can also get a wired version. It just plugs into your controller. Pretty standard technology, pretty uh, and, and generally mandated by law in most places that if you have an in-ground system, you need this. It also gives you freeze protection. Really? So if it's below freezing, this will turn your system off too, which is really nice because I've seen plenty of situations where <laughs> it's below freezing, systems run, things ice up, break, pipes break. It might happen to my house once. It, it, it's, it happens, right? So uh, this uh, it helps prevent that. So, so the rain sensor or the, the rain gauge essentially is, is what that is, is that it's an essential piece of a system. Mm -hmm. It is up high. Yep. What if you're in a situation where you have a lot of tree canopy or you're in a situation where you have no tree canopy, so you've got the wind effect. Does that affect this at all? Or it is can. It you do want to make sure you have it in a pretty exposed area. There are mm -hmm. some crazy wind flows off the roof that you do have to be a little bit worried uh, that can influence this. Mm -hmm. um, it's not going to be a quantitative measurement as like you would have from a um, weather station that will tell you to the hundredth of an inch of how right. much rain has fallen. So this is giving you some general indication. Was it a, a heavy rain that really added to the soil um, and we can turn the system off or was it a light rain and we can probably ignore that we didn't really get much out of that little bit of a drizzle. Right. Uh, and so that, that can help differentiate that. And these new technologies can really help with that. Um, so yeah, so I think something that, you know, make sure you have, again, just hooks onto your, your, uh, your, your, your gutters and you can buy some of this pretty uh, afford affordably in a home center that you can wire into for you know, 20 bucks or less. Right, so. and it is frustrating to drive uh, across town and see an irrigation system happily running after we have two inches of rain that's <laughs> washed all the mulch into the street and yeah. everything is, is full of And it gives water. all of landscape. You know, the turf really takes it hard usually. Right. Oh, they're overwatering grass again. Right. But, I mean, again, if we're watering all of our landscape, we are overwatering the entire landscape um, because of, because of right. that. So. So, so part of that, I think, is the controller, right? People set it for Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Tuesday, whatever it is. They yeah. set it and then they forget it. Talk about that a little bit and controllers and override and other yep. systems that let you do things differently. Yeah, so um, the controller is generally a lot of times the problem, right? Why did we see so many irrigation systems running? Well, it rained on a Tuesday night and controllers go Monday, Wednesday, Friday a lot of times. So the Wednesday water cycle came in uh, and so we saw a lot of watering right after some really heavy rainstorms. And so the, the limiting factor there is the controller really uh, pre, are usually pretty rudimentary. They, they, they're clocks, they know when to turn things on, to turn things off. They haven't really advanced too much until recently. Uh, and so if you have a dumb controller, um, what I like to do is just have it never run. <laughs> right, like so you can program all of your zones. Right. You say, okay, the front yard, these are rotor heads, they need 30 minutes, but those are pop-up heads, and so those only need 10 minutes, and the backyard is more in the sun, so I needed to have this many minutes, right? And you can make programs, but then don't make a start time. And then you just go run program manual whenever you see the lawn get a little bit dry, or you see your trees, or whatever plant you're managing for. So you can be the intelligent one. But a lot of times we put those controllers in garages and we bury them behind bikes and shovels, and you turn it on, <laughs> and you forget about it, and you turn it off in the fall, right? So. Right. What we're seeing now is the rise of the smart controller. And so this is just one of these little chips. It's a Wi-Fi chip that plugs into one of the brands of controllers and most of the different irrigation controllers now for homeowners have some kind of system like this. And so this is generally a Wi-Fi receiver that connects your controller to your Wi-Fi network at your house. And so what that is gonna do is allow you to one, access your system from your phone, which is really great, especially if you're manually watering, mm -hmm. so that you can say, I'm gonna just put my system on because it looks dry today. But what we're, we're really seeing too is that the uh, internet is now giving weather information to the controller mm -hmm. so that it knows, one, how much it rained, but it also can estimate how much did the plant lose. 
Wow. And that's the important part, right? right? It should be equal to what's going in and going out. And too frequently, we err on the side of overwatering right. because we don't want to have drought issues. Mm -hmm. uh, and so these types of systems really make that a lot more you know, able to happen quickly and it's cool to be on your phone and if you want to scare your dogs you just turn it on, on them and they go <laughs> running away because they get blasted with an irrigation head uh, so if they're being bad and they're digging in your beds you got that going for you too so these are some you know pretty affordable little add-ons again most of the homeowner systems now have these little chips and so uh, if you go and reach out to your irrigation person they can plug these in and you can get uh, your Wi-Fi network configured right to your irrigation controller so if we have a terrible storm and the power goes off what happens to your irrigation system? It ain't gonna run. <laughs> yeah, no, we have a lot of storm. But hopefully if you have a big storm, we get some rain with it. So maybe we have some time to get the power back. But those yeah. systems generally need some kind of uh, power to run their solenoids. Uh, and so when you look at you know pictures like this, we had that storm come through, uh, and this is a scenario where having some kind of a of a uh, rain out switch or a smart controller that would have measured and saw, wow, Lincoln got two inches of rain yesterday. I can suspend our programs. It can be helpful. And you might even think about how much money that is. Yeah. I mean, these chips are about $100, but you could easily spend $100 on irrigation of your landscape if you're just willy-nilly doing it on a schedule. Exactly. So in one year, you can recoup all that cost and your plants are gonna be healthier because they're gonna see the roads are wet, it got enough rain, Let's, let's hold that water off and not add more water to an already wet soil. We want to make sure that you watch us on Facebook, 8 o'clock, right after Backyard Farmer Live, and give, give us your comments, ask questions. Let us know what the topics are that you would like to have us talk about, because we don't want to do this if you don't want to engage with it. All right, Bill, so you have something else that yeah. is sort of interesting. So not everybody has an in-ground system, right? right. And uh, we might want to be harvest or uh, taking advantage, harnessing some of this new technology in the irrigation market. And I'm seeing a lot of these. I saw them at different home centers, irrigation suppliers. These are just Bluetooth valve controls that Bluetooth to your phone, just like your headphones. You download the app, you put this on your uh, faucet, and then you can run it to a different hose. And that could be to any type of landscape plant, right? It could be drip emitters for your, your container plants. It could be a soaker hose for shrubs, or it could be a you know, sprinkler for your lawn. And so you can have this kind of set up, and when that plant needs to be watered, you just go on your phone and you can turn it on, or you can even make programs in here so that it would water and you can adjust those in your phone too. And so, you know, again, not too expensive and something that can really uh, harness the, the, the power of the uh, Internet of Things, that's called, so that we can link all these devices and, uh, and we can get better control of how we're watering our plants. That is really interesting. Do they come with six hose connections? Well, you can just put your little valve manifold below, of course, exactly. right? So, and then yeah. you can have all your different drips and emitters and hoses below, and uh, it's one way to do it. Very interesting. So, I know on campus, I've seen them, you know, remotely trying to figure out how to make sure their system is is running right, and I assume that's a lot of what is really possible and great about the way we're going with technology and irrigation, not just the quantity of water, the quality of you know, what you're putting on for the irrigation, but somebody is not over there getting soaked yeah. while somebody is over here saying you need to adjust that head. Yeah, and we really do have um, some things like on our irrigation plants on East Campus, we, we know how much water is going through those pipes. And so if we have a head that is just blowing water out because it got mowed off by mistake, uh, we will get an alert that our system is using more water than it thinks it should be using. And so that's a lot more than the homeowner market, but it is where things are going, mm -hmm. where we're seeing um, soil moisture sensors embedded into your lawn. So there's no decision anymore. If the soil is dry, it will water tomorrow. If the soil is wet, it won't. Wow. And so those are the types of technologies that are coming. You know, I had a master's student looking at thermal cameras taking the temperature of our plants. And when the temperature started getting really high, they're realizing the plant can't cool itself and then it needs to get watered. And so those are some of the technologies that you know, are there and we'll probably see more and more coming to the homeowner market uh, over the next couple of years. So the, the one thing that probably is fairly stable in terms of equipment is the heads themselves. Three or four or five different types. I know John talked about drip emitters. Yeah. Um, on backyard, but just a, a quick comment about 
the types of heads that make the most sense yeah, or doesn't so make any difference? For small areas, if you have an in, uh, in a small uh, installed system, you know, you're going to see pop-up heads. They generally don't throw very far, but they put a lot of water in a small space. So if you're trying to manage how much water to put in a zone, if you have like an area between your sidewalk and your street, you're probably going to see pop-up heads there and know that that area won't need as many minutes of water as the larger areas, which are generally more rotor heads. Mm -hmm. um, one head that we've been using a lot more uh, in Nebraska is these streamer heads. Have you ever seen these? It's they like, sort of go like this. Yeah, there's like fingers of, of water spraying off, and a lot of the thought process there just seems to kind of cut through the Nebraska wind a little bit better, and so mm -hmm. um, we use them a little bit better, a little more for that to try to help mm -hmm. out with wind issues. And if you don't have an in-ground system, um, you know, and you're going to go just do a hose, which is fine. We generally recommend a kind of an impact or you can even get rotors that you place in your lawn and it has a continuous stream. Mm -hmm. The oscillator sprinklers, they, they can be fun, they look nice, um, but a couple problems. One, they can hit the tree foliage and cause those type of diseases. And then the second is when you throw that water in the air, it evaporates. Right. And so a lot of that water isn't hitting the ground as, as it would if we had a more of a continuous stream. So an impact or a rotor is gonna do a lot better uh, for bigger areas or those little kind of fountain ones those will work in smaller spots. Just know that those, those small spots will get wet really fast. You know, I saw, and I haven't seen one of these for a long time, I saw one of the old rain trains. Yeah. Working. We still day. use those. Yeah. If we have to water like a 200 foot space, mm -hmm. you can put a rain, rain train on there and, and you'll uh, let it just kind of work its way across in a mm -hmm. 200, 300 foot string as it kind of works its way from one side or the other. So they still out there exist. And actually, a lot of the pros use it uh, for watering fairways in the sand hills. Really? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, the one, the one thing I recall about them is they'll on occasion tip over. Yeah. And then they just <laughs> spray. Like this. Mm -hmm. Or they come to the end and then they just sort of sit there and you forget that it's on. Yeah. So I would think that that sort of run the rain train from your phone or from the other technology would be a pretty good idea too. Yeah, definitely. So we can, you can get a lot. And the cool thing too is you also get a history. Right. So I can look back and say, when did I water? Oh, I watered this, you know. Uh, and so that's a nice feature to have this calendar. And, and I, one of the apps, uh, the Orbits one, their Beehive app, it tells you when you watered each zone, how much was there. It guesses how much irrigation was applied in inches. And it also tells you what the ET was or what the plant used. Wow. And so you can really get an idea of like, I'm overwatering. And so the technology is there to help guide these decisions. That is really awesome. So if you were going to leave our audience on digging with one or two recommendations, what would they be? Well, the first one is get that, make sure your rain out uh, switch is working, right. right? We don't need to be watering after rainstorms. It's just really unnecessary. And so that's the one thing I would definitely uh, make sure you have. Uh, and then the second thing is, is just think about the why part of watering and don't just be watering because I think I have to water three days a week. Don't water in the afternoon because you think the plant's getting cool. That doesn't make, that actually doesn't make any science sense. It's just a human feeling of what a plant's doing. And then, you know, start to experiment with some of these new technologies to really try to uh, see how we can become more precise in our watering because that's going to improve the health of all of our plants and it's going to save our water resources. And it's also going to save time for the people who are trying to do the watering. Exactly. Or should save time. Should. Unless you're one of those techie people and you just, you just love to mess with it all the time. It happens. <laughs> I know. That is all the time we have for Digging Deeper with Backyard Farmer. We want to say thanks to Bill for coming in and talking to us today. We'll be back next week with another discussion about landscape topics that matter to you. Do be sure to watch Backyard Farmer live every Thursday at 7 p.m. on NET. Thanks for Digging Deeper with Backyard Farmer.